We are live and on our Facebook page today. Uh, joining me is Paul Millard from Boundless. Uh, and hopefully if you guys are on my page, you know who the fuck I am. <laughs> um, but I'm Lydia Lee, the freedom instigator at Screw the Cubicle. And one of my favorite things to do every month is obviously to come here and do live streams. And usually I'm by myself. So I, I have to rant. I get to rant to you guys in front of this weird circle thing of a camera. Uh, but today is going to be a bit more fun for me as well because uh, I've got Paul here. We can actually uh, have a really honest and transparent conversation about a topic that we're both a bit nerdy and obsessed about uh, that we get to share with you today because um, the idea of redefining work, reinventing work is sort of a big buzzword these days, but not, not everybody sort of knows what are the steps to take to do that. It's very scary for example, to give up like a 10 year career or something, you know, for sure, right, that you've made money from uh, and think out of the box when it comes to work. Right. There's so many misconceptions about what that looks like. Uh, obstacles that stand in the way got, uh, you know, Paul and I have very similar stories around, you know, going through like this disillusionment <laughs> when we climbed the corporate ladder. Um, I sort of had to overcome that. But uh, one of the biggest things that we want to talk to you about today, and if you're listening here, uh, please come and say hello, uh, is, is sort of what can you start doing when you're in the crossroad, which happens in every stage of life, right, of what we might categorize as a career crisis, uh, or what I always call like a career meltdown that sort of happened to me or an identity crisis that happens to you when it comes to like, holy shit, I don't know if I want to continue to do the work that I want to do today. What the hell do I do now? If you're in that mode, whatever you categorize this stage of life or this crisis, um, let us know if you've experienced that. And uh, what kind of key questions do you have in mind right now that Paul and I can answer for you as we stream together today. Um, and tell us more about what you do, what you're maybe dreaming to do, what might be in your way around some of these projects that you want to birth, but you've overthought it or, you know, too much self-doubt, whatever they, that is. Uh, we would love to hear from you and, and support you, right, as you sort of answer some of these questions uh, with us today. Um, so before we sort of get into this really important conversation, right, these discovering, uh, you know, opportunities, any big ideas that can come from this place of pause, right, this pausing to be like, what do I want in that next chapter of work that I'm trying to build? What has actually the last 10 years of my career told me about what I like and don't like and never will do again or, you know, or, or maybe passionate about that I can redeploy or re, right, reinvent into my next chapter of work, um, before we get into that conversation, uh, I do want to introduce you to Paul. Paul and I actually, I think it's only been, we're in the honeymoon phase of friendship. <laughs> we just, we got to know each other like late last year and uh, we were introduced by a mutual friend, uh, Victor, right, from Singapore. Uh, that, uh, and then I came on your podcast, we had this awesome conversation, and we just discovered we were nerds about the same topics, and we had such a similar background, even though we came from very different culture and families, but we had the same angst <laughs> when it came to uh, corporate escape stories. Um, and then you came to Bali, right? You came to Bali with your girlfriend, Angie, and we spent a bit of real life time together and discovered we have even more in common, right? Um, and so this is sort of um, when I invited you to go, we need to start bringing these conversations from those coffee shops we hung up, hung out in to sort of a live broadcast. And that's where we are today. Uh, but Paul, um, what's great to sort of introduce you to start with for people who don't know your work and, and what you do. Um, how did you sort of start Boundless? And where did you come from? What happened to your career? What did you used to do? Uh, and what, what led you like, what happened in your life to have led you to start a podcast with Boundless and start um, gathering like information and all the research that you do around the future of work? So a lot of questions. Thank you for <laughs> host. One big thank you for hosting me here, Lydia. Um, <laughs> I'd love to. Uh, perhaps we can hold off on getting to it, but I'd love to get to just how to make friends and how that can help with uh, carving a new path. Yeah. Um, because I th I think the way we met and connected is a, a interesting way of thinking about how do you actually make this work and sustainable. Uh, so maybe we can dive into that later. But um, my story, um, the way I'm thinking about it now is I kind of did a 10-year corporate career. And that seems very distant but very close at the same time in the sense that that's who I was for a long time. I was a person that was good at school. I was good in the working world. 
And I actually landed a lot of jobs that were seen as you were really successful. You made good money. You keep uh, finding things that are pretty interesting, too. And I actually liked most of my corporate career. And I don't I'm not this person that's like, don't work in a full time job. Don't not work. Right. Everyone has to be self-employed or an entrepreneur. I I think, though, I really struggled because I just wanted to keep learning. And I, I've realized that this is hard to do in a lot of full time jobs unless you end up at a company that is growing at mm. a dramatic rate. Yeah, and invest in education um, would, for their employees as well, right? Like, make that a value of, of the corporation. Yeah, well, uh, and I mean, I'm broadly interested in a lot of things. So, I mean, a lot of time companies are just focused on the skills that are going to help people do the jobs they that they want them to do, right? Um, and that's great, um, but I, I want to be studying, like, philosophy and... <laughs> random topics I'm crazy about. And this is only something I've learned through taking a self-employment leap. So mm. um, I was I was what you would call a job hopper. Um, and that is a negative context. And perhaps it should be a negative context because if you're looking for people that just want to stick around and not question things, that was never me. Um, so I'd always have this angst about wanting to learn more and kind of broaden what I was focused on and learning about. So I'd keep moving jobs every, pretty much every 14, actually every 10 months to two and a half years and eventually ran out of moves. Right. Um, I was so frustrated in my last job with the people I was working for, the company, and I was blaming everyone around me except myself mm. and kind of did a year end reflection in 2016 and realized I needed to stop BSing myself. Right. And blaming the people around me. And I was really becoming somebody who I was also at the same time criticizing, like all these people who are kind of cruel in the corporate world, um, rough around the edges. And I was seeing a little glimpse of that in myself and kind of knew I had to make a change. So for mm. me, the easiest thing I knew was to become a freelance consultant. Um, so I'll pause there if you have any uh, questions you want to dive into. But yeah, I mean, um, one of the things that we talked about, you know, where when I, I also had I was also a bit of a job hopper, like every two years, maybe a year and a half to two years, I was changing jobs a lot uh, and, and not realizing why. But a lot of it was about the culture of the company. I think that was a really huge environmentally uh, it stifled me, right? If there's a lot of sort of com competition or non camaraderie feeling uh, where everyone sort of like talk, you know, walk again, you know, on top of each other to get somewhere. I, I remember that was a huge value in a work environment that I, I hated. It was never actually about the job itself. I too quite liked the job that I was hired to do. It was sort of these other things that came with the, the environment, right? Or the boss that had like unrealistic expectations of things, or you look at his life and he's overworked and burnt out and expecting you to work weekends as well, or whatever that was, that became sort of like, it, it left a really bitter taste in my, in, in my mouth, right? Um, but I'm, I'm curious to sort of know, um, like when you said, I didn't like the way that I was like becoming the people that I sort of you know, judged or criticized before. Like, what what were some of those things that happened to you? Like, when were you like, holy shit, I don't like being this person, and I need to take responsibility for what I like, you know, for what I allow to be a part of my life. So, at, in business school, we wrote this essay for a leadership class, and I wrote down these principles of what kind of matters to me. It was like. Do what's right, not what's going to get me ahead. Um, focus on when you stop learning, it's time to keep moving. Um, don't treat people like you wouldn't want to be. Like these very simple ways of like be a good person, be nice, um, stay true to like learning, curiosity, uh, yeah. humor is a big one for me. And I sat down at the end of the year and I would do basically a check in every quarter and assess myself against these. And I had spent the last month uh, trying to make the case that I should be paid more, except when I reflected upon it, I was like, I'm making more than I need. Mm. Um, and I'm 
I'm falling into this trap of like always comparing yourself to people around you, always thinking you need more. And it was just making me miserable because I, I wasn't feeling appreciated. And mm. who knows if I was or not, but I felt like I was doing a lot. I was doing a lot of stuff I didn't want to be doing. And it was just kind of uh, wearing me down, right? And yeah. one thing I've discovered in the self-employment journey is that I, I, and I, this didn't even occur to me when I was working full time, is you can't just work less or take time off. Right. Like it's, you can't it's, make that choice for your option, lifestyle needs. Right? Yeah, totally. Um, so I'd take a week vacation and after 10 days, I'd be like a little um, better. But then I'd go right back into it, right? And go back into that default mode of like not feeling like you have enough, not feeling like this is really the best learning environment. And I didn't really have a good answer for how to solve these other than to kind of hit the eject button and try to start from scratch. Mm. And I love starting from scratch because that means I can learn a ton. Um, and that's mostly what I've found in the self-employment journey is that mm. it's constant creation on this like pathless path that where I don't know what's next. Yeah. And I think everybody sort of starts like I, I like that you, you said, you know, the only way. Uh, it, entrepreneurship is not the only way for everybody. It doesn't need to be the only pathway that allows you more freedom or autonomy, right? Or lifestyle freedom that you require. I mean, in this sort of new future of work, in the gig economy, in, in the freelance economy, right? It's, it's all about sort of different creative ways that you can actually um, create, right? To make a living. Some, some people, like I have, I have clients that have three types of jobs that they've created for themselves. One scratches the itch of like their musician and, you know, art, artistry sort of muscle, right? And then another one is like, I'm just really good here. This is actually where the money's at. And I don't mind doing this for certain types of clients. And that brings in majority of my income and it maybe even funds my other projects. But I'm not actually like, depending on just like all, you know, all my eggs into this one basket and having a bit more of a variety of a, a, almost like a portfolio career or even experimenting with different projects is what is right for her today, right? Maybe later on it's not. And for me, it was like, I kind of like to, to immerse and master and focus on one thing at a time. It's just how I work as a human. And it felt right to do one thing and do it well, you know, and build my skill sets and wisdom and expertise in one area, right? Uh, and yeah. then for you, you were, because you're a, a sort of like self, right? Like you're like, you love to learn and you love to, to, to trial, which is again, a quality not everybody has, right? Uh, that they, they're willing to learn and be humble about that and sort of like create these experimentation projects for themselves. Um, you know, so, so there's, again, you know, this big message here is that like, choose a path that, that works for you at that moment in time. You don't have to quit your job even to do these things. You can actually decide that, I'm just going to like find ways to be happy at my nine to five right now. And like maybe like upskill myself by volunteering for projects. I would usually never volunteer for because what I've got to lose, right? Like I'm just yeah. using this as a funding baby. Maybe it's like a little weird work internship that nobody knows I'm about to quit in about a year's time, but I'm going to like really squeeze in as much, you know, purpose as necessary in this work and not complain of my coworkers anymore and just like try to have a good time at work. But in the evenings and the weekends, I'm exploring something else, right? Exploring different things to, to do so. Um, so like, what did you do? Like when you decided like, okay, like, was it sort of like an overnight decision that you felt, okay, freelancing and consulting is the best way to go. Or did you like sort of like line up some opportunities first before you made that decision? Did you save some money up before you did that? Like what made you feel safe enough to shift the way you worked? So, yeah, I I think financially I always, yeah, I mean, I was spending a decent amount, but compared to my friends and stuff, I was still spending a lot less. Um, I started, I paid off my grad school loans as quick as possible. I lived pretty humbly, especially when I was in Boston, harder to do in uh, New York. Yeah. Um, so I had built up some savings and had paid off my debt which I realize is holding a lot of people back, especially in the U.S., which mm. it just sucks. Um, but um, so I did that. Um, and to be honest, I didn't really have a plan. Um, I was on vacation in Florida and a boss sent me some pretty like just another one of those emails that's just like super direct and vicious 
<laughs> and I was just like, I honestly just responded and was like, I don't know if I can do this anymore. And he kind of fired me right after that. Um, he comes back and he's like, I already talked to the head of the office. Like I realized later he was just trying to like cover his ass. So he looks good. Um, he's like, I talked to the head of the office. You can transfer out. And I was like, oh shit, I think I'm done here. Yeah. Um, so they asked me to stay for a few months. And during those few months, I kind of set up a, uh, LLC for a freelance business. I came up with a name. Um, but when I left, the first thing I did <laughs> was go on a trip for a month. Yeah. Um, so I went to Europe and just actually wandered around. It was the first time I ever did long-term travel in my life. One thing I discovered very quickly, it was just so cheap because I was there for a while and I didn't need like a fancy vacation, right? I could just wander around to like cheap hostels, sleep in bunks, um, eat cheap street food and things like that. Um, so that kind of was the first drop of like where I am now, um, which is way more flexible and living all over the world. Um, but that, yeah, and then came back, ended up landing a couple gigs and then probably for four or five months worked really hard on freelance consulting. I think what I was doing is trying to prove to myself that I could support myself. And I kind of proved that. Mm -hmm. And then at that point, I was like, all right, I can make freelance consulting work. I'm going to stop working for three months. <laughs> right. And and just see what happens. Um, I didn't tell anyone this because if I told people this, people would be like, what do you, what do you mean you're not going to work? You're not going to try and make money. Mm. Um, and that's when Boundless started. Basically, it was just walking around and I was like, hmm, I think that could be an interesting name. Uh, so I set up the site. I had been writing already for probably a few years, and that was kind of just a kick. Um, plus that space of just having nothing to do. Um, really just got energized by starting to write. Um, I actually started a podcast around then, too. Mm -hmm. I basically bought a mic, sat down, and recorded an episode why I want to create a podcast, mm -hmm. published it, and then just kept doing it. Um, and I'm still doing it a year and a half later. Um and then, I mean, the rest of my journey has still pretty much been the same. Like, I do things and then I kind of look for the next experiment or challenge. Yeah. And then it, it just gets from the outside crazier and crazier. But to me, it, it's almost becoming uh, more aligned with, I think, how I'm excited mm -hmm. about designing a life. Yeah. I think, so. you know, one of the, the, the biggest things that people always ask is like, you know, I can't feel like I'm being creative or trying new things if I don't feel safe, right, or financially secure. And I think that is a realistic thing that we have to talk about, where actually m majority of people need to build that safety net, right, that sense of security. Like you did that by living, as you said, humbly and sort of minimalistically, right, like, and you saved a lot of money and you were in high paying jobs, right, like that allowed you to put some things but, aside. But it's not a financial, you, if you're... I think if you're thinking that you can build enough money to feel secure, mm. like you're fooling yourself, right? It's psychological safety yeah. we need, right? Yeah. Um, and I think what happened for me is a shift from I need to take care of everything to myself by mm. myself to I actually have friends, right? Um, who would take like if I ran out of money, I have friends who would feed me and take care of me. And I've just started telling people, like, Lydia, if you run out of money, you can stay with me and I'll pay for all your food. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, and I'm 100% serious. Mm. Like, and I try to tell people this and they're like, wait, the, oh, wow, yeah. And then it's like, how many people in your life would actually do that for you? We have such abundance in a mindset of s scarcity mm. that... Um, that was the shift that happened for me. Ooh. So now I'm making dramatically, dramatically less. Some some months I'm just spending my, um, I'm just spending my savings. But I don't think we can ever have a number that says we're financially secure. If you look at like the financial independent retire early people, like I don't have it. Like I don't have financial security. Yeah, and, and, and everyone is different. Like if you have children and you have a family, there, there are certain 
right, day-to-day -day safety measures that we do need to put, put in place in terms of like Maslow's hierarchy of needs, right? Like you've got to feed ourselves, we need to have shelter, right? However you get to that shelter. I mean, I, I've had a client once that never paid rent for a whole year because she um, house sat and pet sat, right? The, and, and been a part of that community of like house sitting and pet sitting around the world, actually to go rent free, right? There's so many creative ways to do that, but she needed to have a place to live in order to even potentially birth projects because some certain people I think do need to feel like I'm not starving right or struggling to pay rent the next month in order to actually allow myself right to explore things right and I agree that yeah, actually you know right. financial security and 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 even for myself like one of the big conversations we had when we were um, having dinner and, and and having a coffee especially with our significant others right was talking about like how do we define this number of enoughness? Like what is enough when it comes to not just right. the financial part of life, but like, you know, what's enough for me to feel like I am giving and contributing successfully in my work, right? Without needing to grow bigger or scale bigger, right? What is enough in my relationships? What am I willing to do for this type of intimacy? Um, you know, and what, what I want in a family, whatever it is that we strive to do. And, and perhaps that enoughness definition, you know, changes in different stages of life. Like when you have children, it could change, right? What right. the priorities are, what the values are. Um, but in terms of like the day to day, right? Safety, right? That sort of like, I can feed myself. As you said, I can take care of myself. I can earn the minimum what I need to survive. And then from that right. place, I can sort of move up a grade, right? To be like, okay, now that I feel a bit safe in my day to day, now I can explore. Now I can actually not, not put this pressure of that. If I have my first website or my first blog that it needs to monetize right away, right? I can explore to be like, where does this go? And not put that pressure of making money from something new to start with. Like, cause one of the things I really liked about your concept about exploring work has been this gifting um, concept, right? Where it, 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 you, till today, you sort of don't really sell anything on Boundless, right? Like you, you offer, what you call curiosity conversations, which is awesome, right? Where you actually love right. these calls because you're like, great, thanks for telling me all this research I need for my next report and my next blog, right? Uh, and you, you immerse yourself in conversations, which is amazing uh, for networking and building your community. Um, and then you have this gifting piece, right? Of like, hey, if you need my help to sort of decide where you need to go with your career and your work, like you choose what you think is fair to pay me as a way for me to also explore my skills as a mentor. Like how does, how has that sort of worked out for you in Boundless uh, when it comes to exploring this, this version of work for you? So it's been great in terms of a life, um, just connections. I've, I've realized what drives me at the core is friendship and friendship is a foundation for building a business. Um, it sounds crazy to some people. Um, but I think, I think even backing up, like I realized quickly, I think in those months when I was creating the podcast and starting to write more, that, that this was a journey I wanted to keep going on. And I'm thinking of it very long term. So I'm not thinking of it and I'm trying to make as much money as possible. So one thing I did was dramatically lower my expenses. And this yeah. comes back to the financial security. When I was in I left my job in New York and felt terrible because you're just lighting money on fire. Totally. It was yeah. crazy. It's an expensive city, isn't it? So I moved to Boston and I actually lowered my cost of living immediately by like $2,000 a month and lowered right. my tax rate by like 12%. Right. Like 12 absolute, not 12 um, relative percent. Um, so that took some of the burden off. Now I'm living in Taipei. Um, where it's a lot cheaper. Um, so that takes away some of the immediate um, psychological stress. Yeah. Um, so th that's that um, mindset. And then um, I am doing consulting projects. So basically doing consulting projects to like meet a basic income for myself. So my goal is to make like 30 to 40, like, I guess my goal is to make like 35 grand a year mm -hmm. and that US. will cover my, my current, um, cost of living. Mm -hmm. And I'm actually not on track for that right now, but I don't know. I kind of just have faith that it's going to work out. 
Mm-hmm. Um, and the coaching, I realized I didn't want to do coaching as like a core part of my business. And I basically just wanted to keep learning. So the more people I had conversations with, the more I could learn that could influence my writing, which I was really increasingly drawn to. And um, just wanted to keep that going. So I just want to talk to as many people as possible. Yeah. Um, I also just want to keep the option for like real friendship open. Um, mm. <laughs> and I, I found that one, once I'm monetizing the relationship, it kind of um, takes that away. Now I'm, yeah. I'm constantly experimenting and reinventing what this looks like. Um, Cause one thing I've found is that people just don't follow through or commit when it's framed as free. Mm. Um, yeah, I do. And have, that's a psychological a couple, piece as well, isn't it? What, like when it's free, you don't value it sometimes as much yeah. and you don't show up for it as much. Yeah, I do have this one client that just like Venmo's me money after every time we talk. And I was like, <laughs> dude, you, you don't have to Venmo me. He's like, no, it's amazing. Like, I love what you're doing. And it'll just be like, it'll be like small gifts sometimes, but it's like, Hey, here's some noodle money for uh, some good street food in Taiwan. But it's such a, it's such an amazing thing to be part of those type of transactions. And like that guy is a true friend. Mm. Um, and I don't know what's going to come of it, but it seems like this is a better way to do things than try to make as much money as possible from like a wide range of people. Um, so I'm basically doing it as an experiment to learn and figure out, like, how do you integrate this into, um, like, our business economy, yeah. which says you need to charge more. Mm. Uh, you need to extract as much money as possible. Otherwise, you're a sucker mm. and you need to get your money's worth. And I don't think a- anyone likes any of those mindsets. Mm. Um, so I'm well, trying to Well, also I think, like, when, that. you know, because part of what you're doing is is in a way a bit like what I call like a bit of a beta test or a lab, right? Like this internship, work internship opportunity that you're like, I'm not going to put this pressure on myself on like packaging my expertise because I'm not there yet. I'm just actually just cur- I'm in curious zone and curious zone just wh- the only mandate I potentially have is talking to as many people as I can, right? Learning, right? Allowing myself to explore different avenues of what this whole thing means to me without this hidden agenda, right? That it has to be a $50,000 business for, till the, you know, at the end of the year, or I need to have X amount of website subscribers or you know podcast listeners by this time like it releases your the pressure i think from metrics that are not really realistic and actually out of your control like if you do good work people are going to listen and they'll grow your your following like naturally and where you can control the most is your quality of work like what you decide to write right what you decide to give away what you decide to really contribute into the niche or the industry that you think you want to belong to Right. And I think that's a, a really I love that you, you did that with that without these conditions and without that, that hidden agenda. So you don't taint that journey for yourself, because a year from today, perhaps you do decide that you want to, I don't know, run coaching programs or not or write books. Right. And like how has, um, you know, well, I've talked a lot about sort of self-created internships and this mo- like this little beta lab where you're like this mad scientist, you know, that you're like. I'm just going to like concoct a few things that I think I want to do and then I do it and I'm like, oh crap, that one thing I did, I don't like, I don't like coaching. I thought I did. I'm going to take that out now and I'm just going to focus on writing, you know, like sort of like process of elimination through doing right in order to find a focus. Like, um, and I believe this is actually one of the skill sets that you need to learn to be independent. Like this sense of exploration, sense of curiosity, sense of like exper- experimentation that is so important during a career shift or a career transition. Um, can you walk us through sort of like what has been really valuable for you or beneficial for you to do this testing thing for yourself through Boundless, um, you know, and what you've discovered from it all? Yeah, so I think... Yeah, I think, I mean, step one is just like lowering your cost of living, right? So you can have the space and experiment and you don't have the pressure to like meet the um, massive expenses you've built up for yourself. So so that's flipped for me. I think second is I'm trying to keep the journey going. Like it's an infinite game. Like the whole point of playing the game is to keep it going and I'm having a ton of fun. Um, I think... 
some of the things I've done is um, I'm trying to think how to frame this, but uh, basically, so create the space, create the time by lowering your cost of living. And like, I think one of my fears driving me is not to create another job with like mm. a bunch of stuff I constantly need to do. Right. Right. Um, Cause I don't know where I'm headed and I don't know what um, I don't have an end goal. Um, so I've discovered a few things. One is I love learning and I love starting new things. Two is um, I love making sense of complex ideas and then experimenting on them in my own life, trying to simplify them, make make sense of them. So one thing that's emerged is like uh, creating courses, um, mm. digital courses and kind of like learning journeys for people um, is something that I've been driven to. And then third is just the writing. Um, I've discovered I really love writing. Mm. Um, so I'm trying to make sense of all this in myself and like, what does this all mean in today's modern world? There, there's so much BS out there. Yeah. Um, I do a weekly newsletter that's basically trying to break down what is the history philosophy and like, how do you define creativity in our modern conception of work? Um, which for many people is removed from how they want to be spending their time, right? We have this mm. wage work, which is seen as the the ideal um, success, and it's it's stripped away from like what a lot of people just really want to be doing at the core, right? It's shifted our ideal from the how we want to be spending our time on a Tuesday to um, how we want to be spending our money, yeah, and. Um, I'm kind of going off on a tangent here, but no, it's an I, important, I, important point. Yeah. Well, I think, I think the core point is, um, I don't know what I'm doing. I kind of take it three months at a time, do the next experiment, learn from it. Like I'm doing a consulting project now and I'm kind of realizing I don't want to be doing consulting projects that mm. where I'm not learning crazy amounts. Yeah. Like it's purely kind of a money making thing right now and I'm not loving it. Um, but I'm good at it. It's, um, it's somewhat interesting, but, um, I don't really know how to close the gap on like how to turn myself into a, a writer or these coaching things. But I'm basically just creating a bunch of stuff, putting it out there. Mm -hmm. A lot of times I don't get response or people, um, engaging in certain ways and then I just reassess and try the next thing. Yeah. I love that. Um, I, I think that both of us sort of like have, um, this, this deep interest in sort of like always expanding our work in different ways. Right. Like, um, I think one of the, you know, when we talked a bit about the, the future of work and the, the, the new set of skills or human skills that is necessary to feel independent or create an independent career, right. Outside of corporate, the corporate cage or the corporate handcuffs, Right. Um, I'm one of the things that you mentioned was making friends, right? Which is, sounds really simple. <laughs> and actually yeah. we've kind of lost the art of relationship building. I find like since the internet's been born and like, I always meet people that I like are friends with on the online world that belong to like groups and, you know, like communities. And then I meet them in real life and they're like complete opposite of like the persona <laughs> sometimes that are online versus you know like and and yeah. the great at just sort of like whatsapping and i don't know whatever medium of communication but then like the, the then you meet them in real life and like you know the conversation is a bit stagnant <laughs> or like you know like like a bit one-dimensional and you're like whoa okay that's interesting um but i also think we've, we're really stuck sometimes making or thinking that we are making connections in the social media world that we forget these real life relationships as you said right like giving to a new friend and not having expectations that it's got to be this weird transactional exchange or being like insanely curious about someone's journey and being like, how can I support you? How can I help you? Like, I actually am a fan of your work and I don't want anything from you, but actually just like, right. you know, to <laughs> like, collaborate, like, old, like how old school friendships used to be created. Right. And I've really found yeah. that actually when I think about like the top three skill sets that I have had to learn, right or master in order to feel like I have the freedom to create my own path and, and like over and over again because every year is a new reinvention like I, I, I you know that's one thing I had to accept is actually like it's okay to have reinventions and have like a crisis moment every year because it's just a moment to like shift and recalibrate and 
right? Like rejig, there's nothing wrong with that. We should be doing more of that as humans, right? Like, so that was sort of the one first thing that like this acceptance of things change, you can go with the flow and you can actually like use these moments of like, I don't know, sometimes depression or like misalignment to, to, to actually remember what it is that you should be doing. You know, like it's like, yeah. it's a signal. So it's almost like, hey, your body and your mind going, you've gone somewhere weird and we don't like this. So you just need to like slow down and do this where, you know, it's things that you want to do versus things that you think you have to do. Right. So that that sort of rolling with the punches sort of mentality. Um, and then one of the things that I find that has been really helpful in my, you know, continuous reinvention of work and business has been like this humility to like, like know that actually I don't know everything. Right. And that this learning, like I think we share this piece of learning and, and finding out more about ourselves, but also the skill set of like deploying my my knowledge and, um, you know, things that I know how to do in different ways, like instead of just like labeling myself as a coach and that's all I do with my work, it's actually trying to expand ways to deliver my work in different capacities, right? Like sometimes testing it out in the version of speaking or right, going even like taking on gigs. I remember taking on a gig with a couple of banks, financial <laughs> banks in Singapore. And you're like, what the hell? Like how screw the cubicle going into corporate? Like, how does that work? It feels misaligned with your mission. But actually it was my exploration to be like, actually, I know a lot of data about why people fucking quit their jobs. So this could be quite useful to like companies, right? Because if they were going to change the culture there, maybe I could actually be a value here Instead of right. just trying to extract people from corporate all the time, like, what if I actually change my mind and perspective around that, that actually, maybe actually work can be quite joyful being in corporate if things ha happen differently. And how can I affect change that way, rather than just about entrepreneurship and right freelance careers? Like, what if I go into corporate and like, make changes that way internally, you know, could that be an interesting um, interesting uh, expression of my work, right? Like, and so that sort of like, Again, curiosity of experimenting, of taking on gigs and projects that don't really seem like what I was going after, but tried anyway, has been sort of really um, valuable for me to really like see where I could use my skill sets differently as well. Uh, and then I think lastly, you know, the, the building a network of people that support you, I think is so important because just like you and I, you know, talked about, we couldn't stand being in corporate when we were competing with people or having bad bosses or people that didn't respect you. I think in business, it can be really lonely to, again, you are in a way sometimes competing with other people you see online and you feel the sense of like isolation. Like I've got to figure my shit out before I'm allowed to like go and network or build relationships. Um, and it's not like that, isn't it? Like I find that the more that I actually like genuinely get to know people because I love their story. I share my story. I don't always just share what I do for work and how I make a living, but like where our personal stories align and finding common ground that way, right? First, and then maybe we can partner up and work stuff. Like that's almost like secondary sometimes for me where I want to hang out with you and have a beer with you and feel like I like you, not just because you have partnership opportunities that I can go after, you know, feels a lot more authentic and a better way to make friends. Um, so these are sort of like what I've, I felt that's really changed the way that I operated in reinventing my work. Like what has been your, what do you, what has been like three things, two to three things that you think like, Oh my God, this skill set or this learning like really made the difference for me. And I think people should learn this, you know, instead of just like learning how to do digital marketing or build a website, like all the things we think we have to learn when we build a business, like what are some of the human skills or right? Other sort of um, tools that you think we should be learning instead. Yeah, well, I think that's the right framing, right? You use the word human. And I think it is expanding our mindsets of looking at ourselves as not just as workers, but as humans, right? And then how might one want to spend their activities? And I think Ooh. you touched on a few things. You talked, touched on friendship. You touched on basically trying new things that you don't define yourself as. And I think on the first one, the friendship, you actually shared this on uh, our podcast interview. You were in Malaysia and you met a German that was building an online yeah. business. And it kind of blew your mind. And you were like, oh, crap, there's a different way to do things, right? And I think oftentimes we need those friends that are slightly mm. outside of our worldview to say, all right, I kind of have permission from the universe to do something a little crazy um, <laughs> that I seem pulled to, but 
maybe it's not that crazy because then I can just call up that person. They'll be like, oh, you're just like me. Um, so I think that is super important. And I, when people are taking leaps, um, it doesn't matter what kind of leap in your life. It can be anything. It can be – and people naturally do this when they're going to like grad school, right? They right. try to m- connect with people that are at that school and have a conversation and learn what it's about. But we never do this in life, right? Mm. Um, I think we do some other things, right? When you're getting married, you ask people that are married, uh, what is it like? What should I be thinking about? Right. Um, but if you're going from full-time to self-employed, like why don't people reach out and say, hey, um, talk to me about what's going on. I need a friend. Like I have yeah. no idea what I'm doing. And I yeah. think that's what some people are doing when they're reaching out to people like us. But uh, I think people should do it more. And I think people would be surprised at how receptive some people are at uh, those conversations. Mm. I actually re- I reached out to um, this guy, Stephen Worley. Um, I, don't, I don't know if he's watching. Uh, if you are, hi, Stephen. Um, <laughs> but um, in my mind, before I reached out to him, and actually I had the same experience with you, was like, oh, wow, these people are so successful. They're not going to want to talk to me. Mm. Um, and that's crazy, right? Like we both share, we all share like the same nerdy curiosities about whatever the heck we're doing. Yeah. Um, and I had an hour conversation over video with Steven, and it was like we were two long-lost brothers. And it was like this instant type of friendship because we were on a similar journey and curious about similar things. Um, so I think like this is what social media enables, like stop posting, um, stop posting like political posts, right. being angry about the world. You mm. literally have a friend out there right now. Like <laughs> go, go make that friend. Yeah. Um, uh, stop watching Fox news, CNN, MSNBC. I don't know what the mm. equivalents are in Canada. Um, But like just Google like what you're curious about and find the people that are curious and try to make friends with them. Um, So now me me and Steven and me and you are like real world friends now. Yeah. Um, So I've gone from online to offline. And I have people now that want to live in different ways and I don't feel alone. Um, So I can call you up. Um, We've talked about struggling with not knowing what we're doing. Mm -hmm. And it's good to have that conversation now. Whereas like sometimes I talk to people that are employed and uh, full time and they'll just say like, well, maybe you should just get serious and get a job. Right. It's like, okay, I realize that is a potential option. Right. But you're not helping me in like my current struggle right now. Right. right? There are different ways to live. Well, and also I think like we have to be really careful about who we talk to about our dreams, right? Because some, some people will just never be aligned with the vision you have with what you believe is a happy version, right? Or of success and, and, and joy. And, and that's fine. Like yeah, I realize I am I realize I am not on the default path. And I am gonna make people uncomfortable. But <laughs> I would say like the burden for not making somebody on the default path uncomfortable is not on me. Mm. right um i already have that burden on myself i feel uncomfortable all the time i feel constantly uncertain but like my job is not to make you feel comfortable right Mm. um like just because i'm living in a different way does not mean i am saying you're living in the wrong way that's right right. (laughs) um and i think some people because they're trying to follow a path where they do feel comfortable will get upset with me because I'm kind of doing things in a different way. And I'm like, well, I don't it really challenges care how- their status quo too, right? Challenges like the trajectory of their own life. And I, I find that a lot where when you get the naysayers or criticisms of people, I mean, I, that happened to me when I first uh, sort of decided to live in Bali and they're like, what, what the hell are you doing? You're ha- having like a midlife crisis a bit too early. And how the hell are you going to think you're going to raise a family <laughs> in the tropics? Like you don't have, have good health care there. I mean, there were like so mu- many fear mongering things that were sort of thrown at me. Uh, but, well, but a lot of it was like a projection. That too, right? Yeah. Like mm-hmm. when we met in uh, February, we were having conversations about this. We were like, yeah. well, how would you think about kids? How would you right. think about community? And like yeah. actually like building a community around like people that want to carve their paths in a different way. But like maybe would actually want to like help people out if you had kids. Right. Right. And, and also, to be uh, honest, like when I was in less. 
when I was in Vancouver, like when I looked at examples of families, right? Like it was like this sort of isolated, like we all live in our little apartments and we don't have much access to like, you know, like childcare and our parents live like, you know, in the next town over because they can't afford to live where we live. And, you know, there's a sense of like, oh my God, when you have a child, like life is over and like, there's no time for anything because there's not enough resources. Like, you know, there should be more daycares, for example, in corporate buildings. Like there should be more like resources for men to, or, or sorry, like opportunities for men to stay and have paternity leave and <laughs> spend time with their children. I mean, there's so many things, right. That yeah. makes that a reality. And then I actually very much felt that I had to choose between like freedom and having children because I didn't see any good examples of people that actually that really sucks. felt like, you know, they could have children and be free. Like I, you know, like what that like or recreate or redefine what freedom and right those choices are that afford that that style of how they want to raise a family. It was sort of the same way over and over again of what was going on. But it wasn't until I moved abroad, right, and and spoke to mothers who had four kids that were the breadwinners of, you know, really big companies that want, run their entire team remotely or fathers that decide to take the role of, you know, um, yeah. like being at home and, and, and being okay with that and actually supporting their, their wife, you know, or partners to uh, like do really well in their business and how they sort of get, get, um, you know, access to nannies and, you know, like support systems that you didn't have or raising your kids with other families who are also quite remote and nomadic. Right. Like that, that reality was not a part of my, my reality. And just like that moment I met that guy, right. That the guy from Berlin that had the same skill set as I did. It wasn't a bunch of programmers and coders that I couldn't relate to that had remote work. It was a guy that knew marketing. He was a service based guy. I'm like, all of a sudden it's not a mythical creature telling me this life can be reality. It's someone I can relate to. Right. And I think we need to put ourselves in, as you said, right. The importance of finding those people so that that truth, right, and that that reality can be real instead of just reading about them in books or blogs. Like go out there and actually have a real conversation and pick their brain, not on just why they're successful, but like what sort of things they had to overcome to make this happen, you know, or whatever it is that you have curiosity questions about. Yeah, and I I think at the core, that's kind of what I'm trying to do is like figure out what are more models of living. Um, such that I have more flexibility. I think the way our working world is changing, and I, I used to be an organizational change researcher, and I was seeing the direction organizations were going. I think over the long term, there's going to be way more flexibility in terms of remote working, virtual yeah. teams. And let's be blunt, like I think a lot of jobs in the U.S. are just going to be replaced by either lower source lower cost labor doing a better job mm -hmm. in other countries or they're just going to be eliminated, right? Or so, taken over by AI and robots and a different automation of service sometimes. Yeah, so, but I don't know what that future looks like. It just seemed to me that like if I only was in a full-time job, I would limit my flexibility in the future. Mm. Um, so I think a lot of it's about experimenting with different ways of living just so I might have a little more confidence in the future. Yeah. yeah. Um, and having some choices that are beyond just one way of doing it. Well, and I think things have been reframed too. Um, like I see a lot of value in the way, like a lot of my family lives in a small town in Connecticut. Like they're all very close. They support each other. Like my cousins have kids and they all, uh, they have a lot of, like love and support from all the relatives in the town. Like that's beautiful to me. I think that is way more enticing, like smaller communities than mm. thinking about living in a big city again, even though I'm living in uh, Taipei now. Um, but it's, it's constantly trying to figure out what are the different types of uh, paths that are available and how do you actually uh, make those shifts, which yeah. is interesting and exciting to me. Yeah, totally. Now, I want to, because we're almost at, can you believe, an hour of conversation, I could keep going around this, but I do want to talk about one topic that I think really trumps people when it comes to trying to find this thing, uh, and that's the, the idea of, like, finding passion, right, and the definition of passion, and I believe that it was, it, it, you know, we, we, we sort of hear this a lot out there, it's like, go and chase your passion, find your passion, and never let it go, and if you're passionate about something, you're going to love it all the time, right? Like there's so many sort of like uh, statements about, about passion. Uh, and, and I know that it's one of those things that people feel that if they don't feel 
that they found it, that holy grail of whatever passion is supposed to be, they're sort of not allowed to go and do it or experiment with it or take a chance on it. Um, now, was that sort of a question you've ever had, like when you were transitioning from corporate to go, what's next for me? Like, what's that next thing? Um, and, and if you've had people ask you this question, right? Like, where, yeah. where do I find my passion? Like, what, what has been your advice or like, what has your perspective been around this question of passion? Yeah, so I, I think the conversation around it is very, very limited, right? I think you need to start from a point which actually says, are we workers or are we humans, right? And if we're workers, maybe passion makes sense. But if we're human, I think passion suddenly gets a little confusing, right? Mm. Like, wh what do you mean? What are you talking about? Like, we're not supposed to be passionate humans, right? Part of life is suffering and a struggle, <laughs> right? Um, and so if you look at, so, so a few things on passion, I think one, I didn't, it's never been a goal. Um, two is, uh, if you look at the research, the researchers will classify it into two topics, harmonious passion and obsessive passion. And they're basically mapping onto like what people, how people describe their work. And I don't mm. think it's fully gives the right lens, which is, uh, harmonious is you're enjoying the moment and the process of what you're doing. And obsessive passion is about doing something because you're obsessed with the goals or the right. outcomes, right? Right. Um, so you're passionate about working in finance because it gives you constant um, pay raises and huge bonuses every year. Um, and I think that works for some people, but I think it misses the whole freaking point. Mm -hmm. um, so Daniel Kahneman is a Nobel laureate, and he's studied um, a lot of these things, behavior and economic psychology. Um, he quit studying happiness. Um, and the reason he gave was he wasn't convinced people actually wanted to be happy. Mm. Um, what they wanted was a good narrative of their life. So they're able to, even if they were struggling, they could look back and say, yeah, that was that I am happy because I went through that. Right. Um, and he wasn't totally sure if people even had control over this. Like some of this might be genetic or inborn. So he basically gave up studying it. Um, which I found ha fascinating. Um, and then the the final point is that I don't think people know what they really want to be do doing unless they mm. give themselves space and time to actually figure that out. Yeah, I think this whole side hustle mindset, um, it can be practical and useful. Um, but unless you're giving yourself like a month, I'm not sure you can figure out what energizes you. So mm. I've been following and talking to a lot of people that have taken sabbaticals or breaks or extended time off. And almost universally, a lot of them either rediscover passions from their childhood, find things they didn't expect they'd be doing, or suddenly just look at things. And this circles back to what we were talking about before and say, oh, I have time. I'm going to see, try this and see if it's something mm. I want to do a little more of. Yeah. Like one person was just volunteering in her community helping plant gardens. Right. Um, another person started singing in a choir again. Um, one person decided they wanted to write a book because they rediscovered a passion of writing, which mm. they were excited about when they were younger. Right. Um, I don't think we're I don't think we can like think our way towards like things we're drawn to. Right. Yeah. Um, it's almost like so a I bit of like a, uh, like you have to, like, like the environment needs to help you feel that. Cause if you're feeling stressed, overwhelmed, burnt out, you know, like you're spending a lot of your energy and focus in a job you hate or whatever it is, could be in a relationship you hate, whatever it might be. Like, it's not like passion can just sort of like be birthed from that place. Like you have to, like you said, give yourself that, uh, space to play. Right. And, and, and that's what we used to do as children. Right. Like we didn't really like put on a, like a pilot's costume and go, I want to I want to fly airplanes and then think about like, will that make me money? Like kids are just like, I want to today. I'm a pilot today. I want to do this. And I'm going to like obsess with being a pilot and just like, you know, wear this costume every day and be this person. And then <laughs> next week I'm a cowboy. Right. I'm going to now this feels right. <laughs> and I'm going to try yeah. that on for size and just have fun with it. And I think as adults, when we when we pick a passion or when we trial a passion, we sometimes have these unrealistic expectations of what it, it needs to become. Right. Because certain passion, yeah. I mean, you can have more than one passion. Like I have passions that 
should never ever be monetized. They're purely selfish. They're only for my joy and pleasure. It doesn't serve any need for any other person to be involved in that. And that's a personal passion and having different like themes of passion or different purposes of each passion, I think is also important. Like you, you don't need every passion to be monetized or to be a vocation every single time either. Yeah. And I think curiosity is the better word yeah. uh, because I think when we find about? things we're curious about, it often throws you into a learning journey and learning journeys when you actually engage with stuff are not often that fun. Um, so when, when you're learning things, it can be super uncomfortable, super challenging. Um, and curiosity, if it's overwhelming, it's going to keep driving you. Um, so I think that's something important to think about, but I think people like if you're passionate about yoga, um, I think what people are saying is they really enjoy doing yoga and they're drawn to it and it's become something meaningful in life. Mm -hmm. doesn't mean you have to make money from it, right? Um, I'm passionate about making friends. Doesn't mean I need to make money from it. Yeah. Um, and you often see these charts where like what you're good at, what, um, people need, and then what uh, you can get paid for. Mm -hmm. And I think that is a total, like, I don't even have the word, like it, it's just a dumbing down of what life is worth. Right. Mm. Um, it's basically saying it's only worth doing if you can get paid for it. Right. Right. Um, and that's crazy, right? Like, um, if let's say you're passionate about online coaching, um, if you were just born a hundred years ago, that's not an option. Right. (laughs) Right. Um, so it, it just seems like there's a lot of like after the fact, de facto explanations of I'm passionate about this or that, that, but, I would say, like, follow your curiosity and just see where that takes you. Yeah, and there's uh, stages. And then of, like, there's a that, lot of ways to apply that to the world. Yeah, and, and there's nothing wrong with being rewarded financially for something you're good at. Like, that's not what we're talking about here, right? That's like never charge. I mean, and live, you know, completely like a bum. Like, that's not what we're saying here. But actually, in the beginning journey, I think uh, for me anyway, like the minute I when I first was sort of exploring, like, what's next for me. Right. If I was to quit my job, what can I do? What needs to be done? Um, yes. The first thing was sort of like I freelanced as well. That's sort of one of the easiest way to sort of continue to make some income while you buy yourself right. time. Right. So buying yourself space and time. Right. To explore things. But you still got to pay the bills. You got to pay rent. I live downtown in Vancouver. I had to make at least like three grand a month. Right. To like afford life there. Right. And as long as that was like I didn't care. I didn't you know care as much about what I was working on freelance because I knew the purpose for that just to pay the bills. And I'm cool with that. And then I allowed myself to play more with like the curiosities and deep interests of like, what would I fill my time, right? Like learning or reading or exploring if I wasn't given this conditions that they had to turn into a career path, right? Like, how do I want to express myself? What am I reading right now that I just want to share? And that's also how Screw the Cubicle was born. This blog documenting my identity crisis And whether or not I made the right decision leaving a partnership and a six-figure job to pursue the unknown, right? Or was I having an identity crisis and potentially going back to corporate in 12 months? And whatever that may be, at least I'm documenting what's going on in that thought process and decision-making process as I made those decisions. And it was not at all part like meant to be monetized at all until actually the first person that uh, contacted me from Toronto, right? I had my blog for three months at the time. and It was a lawyer from Toronto that was like, I've been reading your blog and I'm wondering, do you help coach people? And I was like, what's a coach? Like, and then it was like, then that sort of helped me to sort of go, Oh, people need mentorship. They don't just want to read a blog. I wonder if I would like coaching. And then that sort of, you know, the next project became like, what if I just take on eight Guinea pigs and coached for free for two months and just see like what I wanted to talk about, what I didn't want to talk about and just be really honest that I'm going to try to help you as much as I can. Right. But I have no idea what the fuck's going to happen in the end of two months. But if you're going to just come with me on this ride, you're going to get my time. You're going to get my my, you know, like empathy for your situation. And you get two brains in your life plan. And let's see where that goes. And if it doesn't go anywhere, that's fine, too. But we, we got to sort of commit to each other for this two months. Are you ready for that sort of adventure with me? And that made it really low pressure for me to explore what coaching meant for me. Right. And, and that it wasn't prescriptive. And it wasn't for- formulaic. It was sort of very kind of conversational, right? And collaborative. And that was the style that I still stick to these days, 
right? Where I'm not putting anyone into a formula. Um, but um, I think, you know, when we think of passion, do you think like deep interest really counts? Like, do you, do, did you sort of think about what am I reading? What am I exploring today that may be useful to other people, right? Um, or did it matter for you? Like, did it, did you think about only on a selfish pursuit? Like, I care about this and that's what I want to write about. Or do you also think a lot about like, how does this serve an external party or an audience? Does that, does that sort of make a difference with the topics and things you choose to write about? Um, I think at max, I'm thinking about one person uh, yeah. in mind when I'm writing. Otherwise, it's just my curiosity. And then, so I've been writing online for about five years. And it first started as I was just kind of frustrated with what was going on around me. People would say one thing and do another. And I'm trying to make sense of like what's happening in the, the corporate world. So I just started writing about it. And it was 2015 and this random person reached out to me and was like, hey, I love your writing. And it was in this really high position in New York. And I'm like, what is going on? Why is this person reaching out to me? Um, like, I can't just talk to this person. They're way more like uh, impressive than me. But I met him. We've since become friends. And um, he was just curious about my ideas I put out there. Mm. And that that was crazy. Um, I realized that writing was a way to connect with people in the real world. Mm. And it, that is basically what convinced me to keep writing. And now I'm meeting like people all the time that reach out for my writing and want to have conversations. Um, they start online typically, but um, often move offline. And so that is what's motivated me to keep kind of scratching my own inch, itch and curiosities because... Mm. We live in a world with three to four billion people are online. You only need like a hundred um, that are interested. They're out there. It doesn't matter if you're interested in like green underwater green basket weaving for um, rabbits, right? Right. Like there's probably 10 other people out there that are interested. <laughs> Um, so people look at my writing and be like, sometimes they're like, you shouldn't write about that. Like you're making people uncomfortable. And it's like, I'm not writing for you. I'm writing for the hundred other weirdos right. who are interested in these topics Yeah, and they keep reaching out to me. So I keep writing. Um, so th th it's really scratching my own curiosity and then Ooh. I'll have conversations with people like you that give me an idea and then I start testing it with people and just kind of try to make sense of it. Yeah. Sometimes I put stuff out there and it's not very good and other times it resonates with like lots of people and it's crazy. Mm. Um, but a lot of times people just like email me questions and I go down rabbit holes to try and answer it and it's just really writing for that one person in mind. Yeah, I love that. And uh, I think because when we start an online website or a blog, there's a pressure to be like, I need to appeal to lots of people because, you know, yeah. again – we're told, right, in the online world, it's all about the big list, it's all about more subscribers, more, 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 that we lose track of what's important. It's like, actually, again, right, the metric we need to align ourselves with is like, what's the quality work and the, the topics that I know I'm motivated to write and share, but I know also that, like, because I have this deep interest, right, you know, you can call it passion, deep interest, obsession, nerdery, whatever you call it, I'm willing to put the time where I'm not counting down the clock for whatever I have to do to make this piece valuable and meaningful. And if it resonates, it resonates. If it doesn't, it doesn't. And you trust that whoever reads it is going to either, you know, tell someone else. And that's right. Something that happens with or without you controlling it. Right. And you're just simply putting out good work, right? Instead of looking good out there, you're being good and mastering your voice and what it is that your expression may be through just churning out more content, right? Or whatever it is that it helps you get into the practice, I think, of expressing yourself. But this is a very, very hard thing uh, in practice. Yeah. Because, so right now I run a website which gets like some traffic, not crazy amounts. Um, but there is a very, very easy path and I know how to do it and I know exactly what I need to create to write certain types of articles that would get lots of clicks or appearance in Google search results. Mm. However, if I write a, um, a listicle of like five things to um, do whatever, um, 
it will get a lot of clicks from people I don't actually want to connect with. So I'll, you right. can easily mistake um, getting thousands of viewers for what you really want, which is like I actually just want to connect with people at the end of the day who are curious about my ideas and like yeah. trust me that I'm going to go deep and mm. do it honestly and not um, fill, fill my site with BS, right? Mm. Um, so I don't write any of those. And I think I've gained trust with people that I'm actually going to go deep and sometimes I'm not going to get it right and it's an ongoing yeah. conversation. But um, yeah, I, I think it can be very hard because um, if if you want clicks on Instagram right now, post like ass pics, right? <laughs> it's true. Like it, it'll work, right? Right. Um, if you want clicks and outrage on Twitter, um, studies show that like the more negative, emotionally charged content you post, the more mm. clicks and retweets you'll get. Yeah. Um, and it's so easy to do that. You get the dopamine hit of the rewards from the uh, attention and mm. you just keep going down that. But I think you need to define like what are you really trying to do here? Yeah. Uh, what and what is are you really for? influencing people to do differently or think differently, right? Because there's yeah. such a big flood of Instagram influencers or learn, like, you know, the other day I saw like an ad on Instagram. It's like, learn how to be a brand influencer or an Instagram influencer. It's like, you know, like, it's like as if there's this paint by numbers way to, you know, build trust and, and, and lead a tribe of people, right? Like, and that's such a personal thing. How you lead what you lead people to do can't be but, this course but, that someone sells. But it might actually, it might work. And this it might is, work, but this yes. Is, this is what people miss. Like, I'm not saying don't do that, but the problem is once you've got a business with those kind of people following you, you, you have a job to do, right? You need to keep mm. doing that. Yeah. And that might lead to burnout or, like, just disconnection from, like, who you really want to be. Mm. Um, so I, I think that is the challenge right and that's where i'm playing the long game the whole purpose of like what i'm doing is to keep the game going yeah. um and to try to build trust with a small amount of people over the long term such that i can keep figuring it out yeah i think that's such people. a such a good place to end it that trust is such a big part of the human side of work um and also doesn't matter whether or not you're building a business or building a blog following I think trust is one of the biggest pieces, right, that allows people to um, back your work, to support your work. And actually, if you were to have something to sell a year down the road, that it's not this like, okay, you know, like, like you build credibility, right? And you validated yourself in a lot of ways by giving first, right? And then so when you do make a request in the future, whether it's to like, hey, come support my new podcast or, you know, come on a retreat or whatever it is that you might sell, there's been a relationship, right? And there's less of that trickery way of you know come and hire me it's more like hey you know we've been there for each other and if you believe that we can continue to have a relationship you know here's how you can support my work and that makes i think business and marketing a lot more humanized and more fun rather than right this hacking the algorithm or tricking people into a funnel <laughs> and that feels so much better for me too yeah and constantly trying to make sense of that and it's hard and i don't fully know how to build an online business in a way that I am proud of yet, but figuring out it as I go. Yeah, totally. Now we want to give a bit of resources and tools like as you know, you listen to this broadcast or watch the replay. Uh, so I'll put a link underneath the video uh, for where you can sign up to get that email for both uh, from both Paul and I. So I'll be uh, giving out a, a few tools to sort of help you think about your skill sets differently. So one of the things I talked about um, when, when we talked about the skill sets you need as a freelancer or being ready and prepared for the future of work is to sort of take a look at like where beyond job titles, what are you good at that can be redeployed into different directions or different interests that might be interesting for you to explore? So I'll be giving you a, a, a tool that's uh, going to help you reflect and think about how you might be able to repurpose your existing uh, knowledge and wisdom that's less about you know industry and niche related, uh, but around purpose, right? And where you could start with that notion of, of you know, like Simon Sinek's notion of like starting with why I want to do the work I do and then thinking about what skill sets can support that purpose for that mission of work. So I'll be giving you that tool um, at, at, after the replay. Uh, Paul, what, what would you like to give away today that's going to help sort of get people 
to that next phase of exploring work and their meaning behind work. So um, what you just mentioned gave me an idea as well. I, I actually created this uh, values assessment tool um, for people to figure out what matters. I ba- Basically, Simon Sinek had a tool and I didn't think it was good enough. So I like crowdsourced like 10 different mm-hmm. options and tried to create um, something that was a little more practical for people. Cool. Um, so I can send you that to share with people. Yeah. Um, I also give you a link for like my reading journey for going from like, uh, business success and like the simple, like straightforward books people often read to like more of the philosophical, um, life generosity questions that, um, helped me take a leap. So that comes with like 35 plus book recommendations awesome. and then. Um, I also have a future of work assessment. It's a free um, assessment if people want to take um, just to see like how they're aligning on things I think matter mm. for uh, carving a different path. Yeah, excellent. I think some really good foundational tools to start with um, as you make these decisions for your career path. Uh, Paul, thank you so much for joining me on this conversation. And I I love talking about this. I can't wait to have you on again where we can jam about uh, other things. Uh, Now, where can people find you if they want to sort of say hello and and thank you for being here and, and explore more around the work that you do? I'm pretty easy to find and pretty responsive. Um, think-boundless.com and you should be able to figure out how to contact me or find me. Um, If you want to just read all my stuff and uh, take some ideas and do your own things, um, go do it. Yay. Uh, And also we'll check back in. I'll tag Paul into this live stream so that he can answer any questions that you might have. Uh, No, we talked about a lot today and I'm sure there's a lot of ideas brewing in your head. Uh, Maybe you've got some questions or or you, you need a little bit of insight on how to pursue something for yourself uh, after listening to this broadcast, um, please let us know. You can tag us. I'm obviously Lydia Lee on Facebook, or you can tag Screw the Cubicle, uh, my page, uh, and I will make sure that you have all the social handles for Paul in case you want to ask him a question. Uh, Paul's been really generous in all sorts of ways, even with me. Every time we've always jumped on a connect call, he's given me tons of great ideas, and um, he's always really generous with his time and his ideas. So uh, definitely uh, give us a ping if we can help and support you uh, on the next phase of reinventing work and reimagining work for yourself. Thanks everyone for joining us.